Hello, good evening and welcome to today's Printify Tech Talk. Uh, my name is Alex McLeod and I'm Head of Design here at Printify. Now, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Irene Au, who has had a long and glittering career in user experience design. Uh, often working at the hottest and most impactful companies in the tech industry at the time, creating products that we've all used every day. So starting at Netscape back in the 90s, and then eight years at Yahoo, where she started as the first interaction designer, eventually rising to be VP of UX, leading a team of 150 designers. Then in 2006, she moved to Google, where she spent six years leading and scaling a global design team that eventually numbered 350 designers. Then in 2012, moving into education with Udacity, where she worked more in a startup phase with product market fit, strategy, and product offering, most recently, she's continued in the startup space as the design partner at Kostler Ventures, where she advises CEOs on the importance of design to their businesses as they scale. Irene, thanks very much for joining us today for a Printify Tech Talk. Thank you for having me. And where are you calling from today? I'm in Palo Alto, California. It's uh, nice and early, 8 a.m. right now. Wonderful, thanks, thanks very much for joining us so early. Uh, in your day over there on the West Coast. Um, so uh, a couple of questions. First of all, uh, how do you feel about being labeled part of a tech talk today rather than a design talk? Do you feel those labels are still relevant? Absolutely. I think design is as much a part of technology as the ones and zeros itself. Um, and I think more and more people are understanding that design is an integral part and uh, goes hand in hand. More and more people have heard the term UX. Um, and while it's still a relatively new profession, I think there's wider acceptance and um, embracing of the notion that you need designers uh, in a technology company as much as you need um, the technology or marketing people or sales or you know finance people or whatever. Um, so I don't take offense. <laughs> I'm an engineer by training, and I think that there's a, a special kinship between designers and engineers. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that leads us on to uh, just give us a, a quick taste of what you're going to be talking to us about today. Mm. Today's talk is going to be uh, about design. Why is it important? Um, and all the different levels at which we can understand design. I think many people think that design is uh, about aesthetics and how it looks, uh, but it's so much more than that. And ultimately, um, anyone who makes anything is a designer, and we all have to take responsibility for that in order for an organization to deliver on a promise of, uh, of having well-designed products or services. Um, and it also ties very deeply to who we are as human beings. Um, and so I'd like to explore that today. Wonderful, sounds great. I'm looking forward to hearing more. Um, before you start though, a couple of small organizational items uh, for our viewers. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, Irene giving a 30 minute presentation uh, and afterwards we'll have a short Q and A session. Uh, so we're gonna need questions uh, and that's where I reach out to you in our lovely audience uh, to please submit questions uh, via Slido. Uh, to do that, please go to the URL uh, Slido, sli.do, and uh, use the hashtag uh, Printify to join and submit your questions. Uh, it's also possible to upvote. Uh, we won't have time to cover all of the submitted questions, so please take this opportunity uh, and we'll try to cover as many of them as possible in the time we have today. So without further ado, I hand the floor to Irene. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for having me. Um, so, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about design today. Um, everywhere we go, we are often surrounded by bad design, from airplane seats that distort our posture to aesthetically inelegant cars, and landscapes that were once green and blue are now paved over. Our surroundings are often full of missed opportunities to introduce delight and joy into people's lives. Um, poorly designed things slow us down and make us sad, like the ugly building in your neighborhood that makes you wince every time you see it, or the TV remote control with too many buttons, 
or the software that just won't work. And these objects and experiences are outcomes of miscommunication, greed, lack of empathy, and lack of focus. Bad design is especially depressing given the price that's imposed on this planet. And sometimes it feels like we're just filling the world with junk. Um, now, as the technology industry matures, we have witnessed greater interest and investment in design. Companies now embrace the notion that design can be a competitive advantage that differentiates them from the competition. And our understanding of what design means has increasingly deepened over the years, moving beyond aesthetics and towards problem solving skills. And for the last couple of decades in the software industry, we claim that a product is well designed when a product is considered useful and usable and desirable. But my claim is that we can do better than that and, and we need to do better than that. So what do I mean by that? Well, before we get too deep, I would like to give you some context by taking a step back to review the different levels at which design can be understood. So the most basic understanding of what design is typically relates to aesthetics. Um, universal principles of beauty, such as the golden ratio or the rule of thirds or principles of proximity and alignment, uh, contrast, uh, repetition, they all inform our innate sense of whether something is beautiful or not. And at this level of understanding, we think of design as the outward appearance of an object, such as whether a car looks fast or expensive or muscly. But design is not just what an object looks like, but also how it works. We consider an object to be well-designed, not only when it is beautiful, but also useful and easy to use. Good design makes our lives easier. It saves us time and reduces cognitive load, which in turn reduces stress in our lives and preserves willpower and goodwill towards others. So in this sense, good design is like a refrigerator. When it works, no one notices, but when it doesn't, it really stinks. Now, when a company consistently delivers an aesthetic and functional quality, design becomes the brand. It becomes the vehicle by which companies create an emotional connection to their customers. Consumers choose to associate themselves with certain brands because the brands embody and represent values and ideals that appeal to them. Now, towards the late 90s, successful design meant orchestrating memorable events for customers, and that memory itself became the product, the experience. Take American Girl dolls, for example. It's not enough to just buy a doll. In the experience economy, you can now design your own doll, customize it to look like you, give her a spa day, get her hair extensions. It's not just about buying a doll, but creating an entire experience around acquiring and owning this doll. Design goes beyond the product and the brand and encompasses the entire customer experience. Now, the term design thinking was popularized by IDEO and Stanford University over the last 10 years. And design thinking, it should not be confused with design, but it refers to a set of cognitive processes directed towards problem solving. So different stages of the design thinking process includes defining the problem, building empathy for users, generating many ideas, prototyping possible solutions, gathering feedback, and iterating. And with this understanding of design, Design is about solving problems. It's a way of thinking in order to approach problem solving. So design is a term that refers to what something or some service looks like, how it behaves, the emotions evoked when people interact with it, the experience one has when one interacts with it, and a way of thinking and acting to solve problems. Design is also a manifestation of the self. Now, what do we mean by the self? A quick Google search comes up with this definition a person's essential being that distinguishes them from others, especially considered as the object of introspection or reflexive action. Any creative endeavor is an expression of the human spirit. When we create something, we create an outward expression of who we are and the values and the virtues that we have internalized. What we make embodies our values and virtues and becomes a tangible expression of ourself. Take fashion design, for example. In the early 1900s, stylish clothes were complicated and very expensive. They were designed to portray women as delicate and passive and were highly impractical for anything other than to sit around and entertain guests in the drawing room. The clothes signaled an aspiration. 
Coco Chanel grew up poor, skinny, and orphaned during this era, but she believed she was as good as the rich girls who spurned her. And with her spunk and flair, she grew up to be a confident, capable woman, energetic, focused, and engaged with the world. Coco Chanel had a different vision of existence for women, and the clothes she designed represented a different ideal from what fashionable clothes of the day were about. Her little black dress introduced in 1926 embodied virtues that she valued in herself, and they reflect a woman who was energetic, competent, and engaged with the world, just like herself. Uh, Chanel's clothes focused on quality. They were not about following the latest trends, and sure enough, Chanel's designs have endured over decades and are still relevant now. Now take a look at these products designed by Dieter Roms for Braun. I just recently learned that Braun is actually pronounced brown, um, but I'm still reprogramming myself. <laughs> these products, just like Roms himself, are humble, modest, and hardworking. And even though these products were created in the middle of the last century, they have inspired the design of many of our beloved technology gadgets today. It's a testament to the endurance and purity of Roms's vision. Now, being simple may make us feel vulnerable, but simplicity is really an achievement. It follows from deep introspection about what really matters. It's a result of hard-won clarity and focus. These acts reflect virtues such as non-striving, non-attachment, and overcoming fear. Well-designed products, just like their makers, they're imbued with modesty. They don't try to attract your attention for no reason. They are just happy to sit in the background and do the work. Now, many of us in product development have seen what the opposite of this looks like. Uh, if you're a designer, how many of you have been asked to save the design of a product when larger fundamental problems make your endeavors feel like putting lipstick on a pig? Um, or have you ever witnessed a company that was afraid to turn away easy revenue opportunities that didn't make sense for the product? That is an outcome of greed. Or how about the development team that keeps adding features just because they can? This is an outcome of attachment or striving. Or maybe the company won't make the hard decision to kill a middling product because they don't wanna make current users angry. That is an outcome of fear. Fear, greed, attachment, those are just a few examples of afflictions of the self that can plague any company. They dilute the purity of the true intention behind what is being made. And for any organization or individual making a product or service, the clarity and simplicity of the design depends crucially on their ability to confront these issues in order to better align with their intention. The story of Steve Jobs returning to Apple in 1997 famously illustrates this point. When Jobs returned to Apple, he simplified the product offering by streamlining the product portfolio, cutting the product line from 350 products to just 10 products. He maintained that what really mattered was not only what they was not what they did do, but what they didn't do. And instead of producing so many products, Jobs focused on a few machines that were meticulously perfected. Jobs had a clear intention, a commitment to quality over quantity. Many executives may make the same claim, but they are really reluctant to actually make tough choices. If you consider how emotionally hard it can be to cut products that have already been designed and manufactured and to eliminate jobs for as many as 3,000 employees, which is what happened at the time for Apple, Jobs wasn't afraid of making a tough choice that would make him unpopular. He was willing to risk his popularity with others in the pursuit of upholding his vision, which he believed would save the business and serve users better. He transcended any feelings of greed, attachment, and fear that might accompany such a decision. When we are fearful, greedy, or attached, our actions get manifested in the design as complexity and clutter. The more able we are to transcend our beliefs about ourself, the better we can create a great design that clearly expresses our intention. What we create reflects our inner state. And as much as what we make embodies our self, we pass on our attributes, our vision, our intent to others when they consume what we make. Design is the culmination of intentions, values, and principles manifested in tangible form and passed on to another. Design has the power to shape how we think and feel. This is Adam Galinsky. He's a professor at Columbia University. 
He studied the impact clothes can have on how we think about ourselves and our performance. Participants were given the Stroop test where they're shown names of various colors printed in a different color, and they were asked to name the color that they see. This is a pretty tricky test because our natural tendency is to read the name of the color rather than the color we perceive. But those who wore white lab coats perform significantly better on this test than those who wore their ordinary clothes. What's also interesting is that this happened when the participants were told they were wearing white lab coats. In another variation of this experiment, participants were told they were wearing a painter's coat. Same coat, but now it's a painter's coat. And this time, they did not experience the same gains in performances on the strip test. Why? Well, because they said they were projecting a certain image of the kind of person who would wear such a coat, like a creative artist who doesn't care about accuracy and performance which I dispute <laughs> personally as someone who would like to think that I'm somewhat creative. <laughs> but these participants, they were primed to project a certain image about the white garment by being told what it was, which in turn affected how they performed. Now in everyday life, we are not usually told what the psychological qualities are of the objects we use. But when something is designed with clear intention, that intention is more effectively channeled through that creation and it's conveyed to the recipient of that design. So let's go back to Coco Chanel. In Chanel's little black dress, women could be efficient, organized, serious, and in control, yet while still being graceful and hip. When a woman wears a Chanel dress, she embodies the virtues that Chanel um, imbued in her designs, whether or not she knows anything about who Coco Chanel was. Or consider the brawn watch. On the surface, the watch looks like a very ordinary watch, but on a deeper level, it hints at psychological or even spiritual ideals of purity, simplicity, and harmony. The watch does more than tell us what time it is. It gently nudges us towards the ideals it conveys and represents. It's the kind of watch that makes us want to be on time. And contrast this with the G-Shock watch by Casio. This watch conveys a focus on durability, even under the duress of water and shock. The wearer of this watch is making a statement that says he is sporty, tough, and rugged. Or this watch, this is called the slow watch. This watch has a 24 hour face as opposed to 12 hours. The density of the numbers on the watch means that it's utterly impossible to distinguish between 3.41 PM versus 3.42 PM. The wearer of this watch does not intend to have his day scheduled down to the minute, but rather to live in larger increments of time, like 15 minutes. The slow founders assert on their website, slow is not a speed. It is a mindset that most of us somehow lost. Let's make time to bring slow back into our life. Be slow. The founders of slow value the slow life and by wearing the watch they designed, the wearer is able to live the slow life too. We may not always be consciously aware or able to describe how objects make us feel, but we do sense a spirit or an energy that emanates from the objects we use and the experiences we engage with. The Eames Lounge Chair by Charles and Ray Eames. This is designed in the mid-century. It's reminiscent of a bygone era. Its masculine structure offers a supportive man cave in a chair, beckoning the owner to sit, relax, and unwind after a busy day, maybe read the paper or watch TV until dinner is ready. The Wishbone Chair by Hans Wegner communicates a set of important values, straightforwardness, honesty, and elegance. It is sturdy without being hefty and heavy. It's humble and casual, but dignified. It's welcoming, unimposing design welcomes us to sit on it. And as we do, we become a little bit more like it. Various religions implicitly understand this relationship between design and its impact on the human spirit. From the ornate and ostentatious to the streamlined and simple, places of worship have been designed for centuries to evoke a certain set of virtues and ideals and maybe bring people a little closer to God. Whether you are religious or not, you cannot help but pause and appreciate the beauty of these places of worship and prayer, bringing you a little closer to serenity and equanimity. A well-designed object or space can bring out the best in us. Conversely, a poorly designed object can represent the worst sides of human nature. 
greed, insensitivity, the desire to prevail no matter what the cost. As much as beauty promises goodness, ugliness evokes despair, suffering, and immorality. Ian Fleming, author of the James Bond series, implicitly understood this. One of his most notorious villains, Goldfinger, was named after a real person named Erno Goldfinger. Erno Goldfinger was an architect who was known for making giant, hulking, austere concrete buildings that were characteristic of the brutalist architectural movement. This architectural trend, popular in the 1950s and 60s, was known for its use of cheap concrete building materials and became popular after World War II because it provided a sense of security in areas that had been devastated during bombings. Brutalism was also associated with a socialist utopian ideology which prevailed in European communist countries from the mid 1960s to the late 1980s. And the foreboding style conjures images of totalitarianism, violence, force, stark utility, the severe exteriors of these buildings appear unimaginative and bland. And to Fleming, the ugliness of brutalist architecture was personified as evil, embodied in his fictional evil villain, Goldfinger. When positive ideals are manifested in objects and principles, uh, in objects and products we use, those objects and products play sort of a positive psychological or spiritual role in our lives. Well-designed products are manifestations of mindfulness, virtues like patience, resilience, iteration, focus, empathy, non-attachment, all at play. And when they are contained in physical things, those psychological qualities that are otherwise often intermittent in our thoughts and conduct become more stable and constant. An inner evolution takes place, which is why we form an emotional connection to well-designed things. Well-designed objects help us grow into our better selves and serve as ever-present reminders of what we could be. Now, the, in, the ability for a design to influence how we think and feel goes beyond physical objects and spaces and extends into ephemeral experiences like service design and digital design. For example, with Google, Larry and Sergey aim to build powerful technology that helps people find information efficiently. They invented algorithms made it to make it impossible that made it possible to find information easily, but it didn't just stop there. They committed billions of dollars of capital outlay to create infrastructure to make web search as fast as possible. They championed company objectives called OKRs centered around reducing latency, which is the time it takes to get search results back after someone submits a search query. And they also did this by bringing to life a set of values around efficiency and scale through a streamlined interface. Everything done at Google was prioritized against creating a powerful, efficient tool. By using Google to search the web or manage our email or documents and photos, we in turn feel powerful, efficient, and capable. Here's another example by a company I work with called Nutanix. Nutanix is an enterprise cloud company that makes data center infrastructure. The leadership champions virtues like empathy and frictionless throughout the company. We often don't think of enterprise companies as being associated with great design, but I just wanna show you a few examples of how these virtues play out in the customer experience. Most customer support interfaces bury the ability to escalate cases because they're time consuming and costly. Nutanix puts this functionality at the very top in the upper right-hand corner which is sending a message to its customer support representatives that no issue is too small, no customer too unimportant to be escalated. Another example is with upgrading the data center software. Upgrading software for data centers is typically complicated and risk prone, especially when you have large clusters of machines that need to be upgraded. Understanding this challenge, the company reduced all of these activities to a one-click operation where the system administrator starts the process and Nutanix does the rest. And you can see from enthusiastic tweets how much their customers feel cared for. They can upgrade their data centers from their Tesla or perform upgrades while barbecuing. In summary, what we make and consume is what we become. And what we become, so we make. There's this dialectic relationship between the objects we create and the objects we use, or the products and services, or what we surround ourselves with. We need good design in this world, not because we wanna be extravagant or superfluous and not to get people to buy more stuff, but because good design helps us be the best version of ourselves. 
in order to make well-designed products, we need to transcend that which holds us back from making things great. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's greed, maybe it's attachment, maybe it's ego. And when we understand and embody the virtues we want to express through the design, we become oriented towards wholesome action and that gets expressed in what we design. And this in turn affects how others think and feel. And that is the greatest gift we can possibly share as makers. Thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed. That was great. Yeah, um, super, super interesting. Uh, particularly, I liked the bit about, uh, you know, um, Goldfinger and the Trellick Tower. Yeah. <laughs> um, excellent. Um, so uh, some questions sort of pop, popped into my mind. You were talking there about the, uh, the importance of design. Uh, and I, I know this is something that you work with a lot with uh, in your role with uh, uh, Kosla Ventures. Um, so I'll just ask you a quick question before, from me before we go into the Slido questions. Um, and this one is kind of for all the frustrated designers out there, um, many of whom I, I find I meet in interviews and they often tell the same story. So uh, designers today often find themselves in organizational cultures that don't value user research or understand the value that user-centric design can deliver. What would you say firstly to those designers and secondly to the leaders of those organizations? Yeah they're not alone. I mean, this is probably the number one mistake uh, that I see organizations, especially startups make is an underinvestment in user research. Um, and uh, I would say, do what you can, start where you are. Um, you don't need a huge budget to do user research. Um, and uh, you can bootstrap, show the value, once people see the value, then it becomes a positive virtuous cycle where you can get hopefully more budget and resources to do user research. Anyone can do qualitative user research, but understand what motivates your organization and where the opening is for you to come in to uh, introduce some methodologies that give the organization greater exposure towards your users so that they can build some empathy for them. For example, most organizations that aren't familiar with user research, they might not have an appetite for generative exploratory research, but they might be more interested in tactical efforts that help them meet their immediate goals. Um, so for example, uh, if it's a culture that's very focused on A-B testing, or maybe they look at the usage logs to see um, you know, where are people dropping off or oh, people are not clicking on this particular button that much, you know, there's a chance to do qualitative usability studies to help the team understand the why behind the numbers that they're seeing, because you know people don't really know what's going on behind the scenes if you just look at the numbers. The numbers only tell you so much. Um, or maybe people on the team have never actually watched their users use their product before, so that's another chance. Like if you can um, uh, do usability studies, film people using the product, and if you can't get your team members to watch in real time show video clips of real users using the product at team meetings and maybe at company all hands so that you can motivate the organization to do better. And I've seen this time and time again that anytime people actually watch users using their product and stumble in areas where the team thinks it's so obvious, <laughs> it's very humbling. And that is usually enough for people to want to go back and redesign and improve the product. And then you can begin this cycle of iterative design, execution, and iteration. Um, and, and, and then from there, people start to see the value of user research. And then you can build off of that and start advancing your efforts in more strategic ways. Um, for leaders of organizations that are skeptical, I see many common misperceptions about uh, what user research is. Many people think that it's focus groups that you're you're asking people what they want. And that's really not what user research is about. User research is about uh, observation. It's not about asking what people want, but it's about watching people in their natural environments to understand their motivations, their intentions, their behavioral patterns, their thought processes, all of which goes towards um, when, when, you, when you understand that, you have a greater empathetic understanding of who you're serving, who are you building for? Um, and with that understanding, it just allows you to build 
better products and services for them. So user research in that way is like rocket fuel that propels a company to get to the right answer faster. Nice, thank you very much. Very good. Um, so I can go on to Slido and, and uh, see what other questions we have. Um, top of the list at the moment is how to test that design is good or to detect bad design. So what's the sort of mm. metrics one can have around design? Yeah, you know, um, uh, this was very in vogue maybe 20 years ago, um, kind of trying to find ways to test and measure the quality of the design. And um, you can, there are certainly techniques that people have tried to develop such as usability benchmarking, particularly for very task oriented kind of products um, people have looked at measuring time on task or um, the ability for people to achieve their goals, were they successful or not. Um, I believe that in any design focused organization and in, in any organization that values design, they do not think of design this way. Um, they just believe that design is a key differentiator for them that um, where an investment in design will result in better business outcomes. Um, and it's, it's just something they naturally believe is um, good for people and therefore good for business. It's kind of like, what is the energy that you want to put out into the world? Any experience or product or service is designed. Anything you make is designed. The difference is whether you're intentional about it and thoughtful, or if you just didn't think about it, if you didn't pay attention to the details, there is only thoughtful design or careless design. And so you're making an implicit choice. Um, anytime you're making anything, you're choosing to either carelessly design by not paying attention to the design, or you're putting intentionality and thoughtfulness into it. And as I just spent the last half hour talking about in my talk, um, um, my, my hope is that we are more deliberate and intentional about how we want to, what are the virtues that we want to put out into this world and hopefully um, uplift people that we're serving um, through great design. Now I'll just take a step back a little bit. How do you operationalize this? I think it's really important for organizations to define their design principles. Design principles are really a tool for codifying an organization's values and virtues, how they want people to feel when they use the pro company's products and services. And um, there are universal design principles, you know, and you can look these up. The most famous set is from Dieter Rams. Um, but it's also important for an organization to define their own principles for the company. Um, how do you want your pr uh, product to make people feel? And do people love your product? So for example, in my talk, I gave examples um, from Brown or Braun, <laughs> designed by Dieter Brahms. So the, the key design principle for that company was less but better. The idea being that the company, when they designed their products, they would simplify and reduce everything down to only what was essential and amplify what made it great. Um, so it was really less but better. Muji, on the other hand, and I didn't call out Muji as a company specifically, but I did show a slide or two with products from Muji. Muji is a Japanese company that offers kind of household goods. And their key design principle is this notion of kenketsu, um, simplicity. Their aspiration was to provide people with a sense of calm and serenity in their otherwise busy lives. And so that's why their hope is that um, by surrounding yourself with Muji products, that you reduce clutter and you introduce calm into your life. And that's really the, the feeling that is evoked whenever you walk into a Muji store. Um, this also applies to digital products and services. So, so like at Google, the key design principle there was fast. Uh, Larry and Sergey believed that um, without a performant service, without a performant website, 
people would just leave Google and go use some other web search service. And that's why, as I mentioned in my talk, they invested so much money in making Google fast. Um, and so I think for any company or organization, it's crucial to understand what is your key design principle? What makes you uniquely special that differentiates you from your competitors? And how do you operationalize that and imbue that into every aspect of what the company does, including the user interface design or the product design, but also the infrastructure, the customer service, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's not something you can measure. I mean, there are ways that you can measure um, how people feel. Um, and I have worked with some companies that have attempted to do that. And at the end of the day, they were unsuccessful because they were just so focused on the metrics that they lost sight of the, the whole. Uh, an analogy may be, you know, how do you, how do you measure the worthiness of a human being? You know, you would never focus on just quantitative metrics such as their SAT score or their GPA or how tall they are or how much they weigh. That would be awful. You would never do that for a human being. And similarly, you should never do that for a product or service that you're creating as an offering for other people to use. There is the quantitative side. There's also the qualitative side. Uh, for my human being analogy, it may be how big of a heart do they have? Are they a good person? Are they honest? Are they truthful? Are they loving? Are they kind? And similarly, for a product or service, there are qualitative attributes which you as the maker are imbuing into the product that, um, that you, you want the product to emanate. And that's really difficult to measure, but still crucially important. Super interesting. And uh, it reminds me of the debate about whether GDP is the only real measure for the development of civilization or not. Yeah. Currently, currently it is, but it's a very, uh, you know, it's very much a metric. Um, good. Next question then. Um, this one comes uh, straight from the top, Printify. Uh, the question is, what do CEOs typically mis misunderstand most about the need for design? And what arguments convince them otherwise? I mean, you've touched on it in some of your other answers, actually, but I guess you face this a lot uh, with uh, entrepreneurial mindset uh, kind of uh, individuals who are in a hurry, trying to drive, trying to trying to either you know build their startup, get uh, product market fit, and achieve some traction or scale. Yeah, you know, um, over the past several years, I have um, not really had to have too many conversations with CEOs about the importance of design. I think that um, many of them understand intellectually that design is important. I think that they've seen the rise and success of Apple, uh, for example, as evidence and also inspiration. But I think the, the place where it falls apart is actually in making it real. So once they've hired their designers, first of all, did they get the right kind of talent? Um, design is a very multidisciplinary function and um, you need people from all kinds of backgrounds, whether it's anthropology, psychology, writing, um, graphic design, um, cognitive science, computer science, sometimes architecture. Um, you know, it's a very multidisciplinary field and all of the skills are rarely embodied in a single human being. And yet it's so tempting for many CEOs to try to find that one unicorn that um, is awesome at all of those things. And, and what often happens is that they hire somebody who's kind of mediocre at it all, or they're just really junior and they haven't advanced enough in their careers to specialize in a particular area. Um, so, so one question is like, did they hire the right person? Um, I would also say that designers who are really excellent in like um, creative direction, marketing, branding, advertising, that's a different part of the brain that's being used than those who specialize in product design which as I said before, has a real strong kinship with engineering. Um, so there are different types of ways of uh, designing and thinking. So you need the right kind of talent. You also need to empower them. Um, where are they positioned within the organization? Are they involved early enough in product development to be able to influence what and how things get built? Um, another uh, key question is like, how are decisions made? Um, who gets to decide in the end? Um, so these questions around organizational design and empowerment and process um, are really key 
to making design successful within an organization. It's very easy to, to get it wrong. Nice, thank you very much. Um, now a question's come up, I didn't put this one in, but um, I think it's super interesting. Uh, and I remember asking about this before, the first time we met. Uh, can you tell us the genesis story about how the Google Design Sprint methodology was developed? Um, well, at the time that I joined Google in 2006, um, Google was famously engineering focused, uh, deliberately so. Like Larry actively managed the ratio of engineers in the company to every other function. And once I realized that, I understood that um, no matter how fast I hired um, designers into the organization, we would never be in a position to um, keep up uh, with the numbers of engineers who were coming to us, uh, having already invented things and then asking us to, to make things look better, which is never, it never feels good for design and never sets up design for success. Um, what we wanted to do was to teach uh, design thinking to everyone in the company and engage all the makers, including the engineers, in uh, the design thinking process so that they, if they built an empathetic understanding of who they were building for, then perhaps their inventions would be better directed towards solving people's needs. So I hired uh, Charles Warren, who came from IDEO, and he was part of the organization transformation team at the time at IDEO. Uh, and I tasked him with coming into Google and bringing in those kinds of methods and um, workshops into Google. Um, and workshops, those are kind of like, that's his um, magic secret sauce. So he um, kind of created this um, uh, design thinking workshop process. It was really an experience that we took product managers and engineers and designers through. Um, to go out into the field, watch people, understand their latent unmet needs, um, generate a lot of possible ideas for how to help these people. How could Google help these people given the needs that we understood? And then to prototype and test and iterate on those ideas. Um, and so that became a huge um, thing. It just captivated everyone in the organization that it touched. Um, and so we developed a train the trainers, um, kind of program where designers then learned facilitation skills to be able to fil facilitate similar workshops so that we could scale beyond Charles. And there was this uh, designer, Jake Knapp, who at the time worked on uh, Gmail and Hangouts. And uh, he was always very interested in process and uh, kind of partnered with Charles to see, well, how could we make this process better? How could we streamline this? How could we make it uh, work for any kind of project at Google? And um, he came to me and he said, I would like to focus on this full time. And I supported him and said, yes, because to me, when you see an employee so passionate about developing something and taking a personal interest and curiosity in a space that could be so useful for so many people, like you really have to support that. And so he did. And so he developed, he kind of uh, uh, refined and further developed the design sprint methodology. Uh, in 2011, when Larry Page became CEO, he decentralized all of the functions within Google. So rather than have a monolithic engineering organization and a monolithic product management organization and a more modest <laughs> design organization, he decentralized everybody. And uh, there was this reorg, um, which left uh, people in central positions like Jake um, kind of without a home because he wasn't singularly aligned with a particular product area. Um, and so I suggested to him that he go to Google Ventures where he could continue his work and kind of propagate design sprints to the startups in our in the Google Ventures portfolio. And so that's what he did. And, and over time, uh, the question was like, well, how do we scale this work? How do we get this into the community? How do we benefit companies beyond just the startups in the Google Ventures portfolio? And so then he and his colleagues decided to write a book um, which became the design sprint book. Um, and it's, it's just so wonderful to see um, how this has taken off um, and really exciting that uh, now there's a playbook uh, available to anyone who's interested in um, taking a team through a design thinking process that's really practical and uh, with, with tangible output at the end because after five days, 
you end up with at least one prototype that you can user test. Um, I think so many people have gone through uh, bad brainstorms where there isn't a clear process for making decisions or it's like loudest person in the room wins or it's like most senior ranking person <laughs> gets their idea built um, or that uh, people can invest a lot of time in a, in a hackathon or a workshop and end up with really no clear next step. And the design sprint methodology kind of addresses all of those problems and leaves people with a sense of accomplishment um, and achievement because there, there is something that comes out at the end that the team can run with. Yeah, exactly. I think it's really uh, a very digestible form of the design process, which is really nice. And it's, it's a great kind of starter for many people who aren't familiar with it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Nice one. Thank you very much. Well, uh, yeah. Congratulations on your part in the development of that, that methodology. Oh, um, I just said <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. But that could be important as well. Um, OK, top of the chart at the moment is a question. Uh, how can a small team of three to four people not get too bogged down by user research and balance user input with agility of founder led ideas? So I guess this is about like the vision of the founder um versus uh user research which in the assumption of the question will bog you down um hopefully they're not in opposition to each other hmm. and um you know in the best case scenario they are working in synchronicity and if they aren't then i would look at why is that the case um for example um if the founder has a bunch of ideas that are completely orthogonal to what people really need, then find a way to engage the founder uh, in the user research. Can they participate in the user interviews or in the usability studies or field studies, for example? Um, one of the things that uh, the Google UX team did when Sundar Pichai became CEO, he had this initiative called Next Billion Users. Um, and the question was, like uh, how can Google better serve all the people out there in this world, many of whom may not have the same kind of behavioral and usage patterns as people in the US. And so the Google UX team sponsored a series of executive uh, user research activities where they actually took executives out into the field. They went to Africa, they went to Indonesia, they went to India to look at how are people using the internet in these places? And what do they what do they need? What are their priorities? And because the executives were part of this, they were active participants in this research endeavor, um, they would come back to their home offices and they had a clear understanding of what needed to be done and what their relative importance was. And that propagated all the way down the organization. Um, so you know if if the founder is coming up with things that are orthogonal to user research, then find ways to, align the two so that they're working together. Um, if, uh, you know, if the, the founder doesn't have time, you know, then you really have to find ways to um, make it fun for them so that they feel like it is worth their time. Uh, maybe show videos of uh, research interviews or, um, you know, participants saying things that um, can motivate and inspire the whole team. I'd also look for partners within the company. So not just the founder, but is there a CTO? Is there a, ch a chief marketing person? Like, are there other people who may rally around, um, you know, whatever, um, I mean, in this case, you're saying bogged down in user research, but I'm assuming that, you know, there's some value in what's being unearthed in the user research. Are there other people who can rally around that and help bring the founder along? Um, so um, there's, a, there's a, a lot of working the organization kind of work that has to happen as well to bring, to come to alignment. Exactly. Yeah. There's a good book I read before called It's Our Research, which is about mm -hmm. bringing, bringing everybody in the organization to, uh, to believe in, in what's going on. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of good questions coming in. Um, I'm actually going to go for one that's uh, engineering related. It's quite near the bottom, but uh, what would be your advice for engineers for them to become more design conscious? Oh, you know, some of the best and some of the best designers I've ever worked with actually were engineers who became designers. 
Uh, Nicholas Jitkoff is one example who invented Quicksilver and uh, you know came to me within my first three months at Google and said, I want to be a designer. And I said, okay. <laughs> um, and he eventually like he 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 invented, he created material, he created Google's common look and feel. He went on to Dropbox and now he's working at Oculus. Um, you know, engineers make such great designers a lot of times because they there is a lot of kinship to how they think. They also have the skills to make ideas tangible. Um, they can make, you know, they can build prototypes and they can test those ideas out and then they can go back and iterate. Um, I think for engineers, the best thing they can do is to soak up everything they can about, um, um, you know, uh, how, how can they better understand users? How can they better understand the people that they're building for? Um, if they're interested in um, aesthetics and um, visual design, um, they can make for some of the most powerful engineers too, because um, a lot of times uh, engineers who don't see the details and don't appreciate the design details can't execute on them because they just don't see what they're missing. Maybe it's like alignment problems or things like that. So those engineers who are really sensitive to the design details um, often make for great design engineers um, because they can preserve the integrity of the vision and deliver on that. Um, so those are just a few ways. Um, user research, visual design, get stronger in those areas. Nice, thank you. Um, another one jumping around is uh, what qualities are you looking for in designers and how do you check for them? Oh, you like, know- like, like um, when you when you were recruiting, I guess you're not recruiting. Yeah, so well, I still do a lot of interviewing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are hard skills and then there are soft skills. And as I mentioned before, user experience design is a very multidisciplinary field. And so the first thing I do is I try to understand what does the organization need? Do they need somebody who's more heavily focused on user experience and interaction design? Or do they need somebody who's more heavily weighted towards visual design or more heavily weighted towards user research, whatever the case may be. And that will affect um, the hard skills that I screen for. And um, those skills are often manifested through the portfolio, through work samples. Um, and so I, I look at the training, the experience, the background, the portfolio, and, uh, and then the story behind the projects in their portfolio also reveals so much, not just the hard skills that were employed, uh, such as you know, their analysis of the problem or uh, the synthesis of the research, or um, the number of different ideas they explored and how they arrived at the right one. Um, but I'm also looking for soft skills. I'm looking for emotional intelligence too. I'm looking at how self-reflective are they? How much are they learning um, about um, the problem that they're working on and the people that they're serving? And how reflective are they on uh, the quality of the work? Uh, any designer who's good should be able to speak intelligently about um, if they had more time, what would they do differently? Uh, or what would, what would they pursue uh, later? Um, or they might be able to talk about the mistakes that they've made and what they would have done differently. How did they learn from that experience? Um, how well did they collaborate with others? How did they turn difficult situations around and make them successful? Um, you know, their ability to work with others, um, and so on and so forth. So all of those are emotional intelligence uh, qualities that um, really can make or break a designer. Um, I teach a class at Stanford and I often tell these students that the hard skills will help you get in the door, will help you land the job, but it's the soft skills that will either launch your career and propel it forward or will sink it. Interesting, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, jumping around, some of these are things we've covered already. Um, here's one. What would you say were the biggest single headline learnings from your time at Yahoo and Google respectively? And I guess that, that leads on to how were the two companies different at the time you were there? <laughs> I could go on a long time about this. <laughs> um, it, you know, the, when I compare and contrast Yahoo and Google, it really reveals, it's a fascinating case study around how um, a company thinks and behaves, how a company thinks and operates 
um, and how that translates into the product design. On the surface, the two companies seem very comparable. Both companies were founded by graduate students in computer science at Stanford. Both, uh, like all four founders, sought to organize the information that was on the internet and make it available for people and accessible. Um, but they approached it in very different ways. And a lot of that was the byproduct of the relative time periods when these companies were founded. So when Yahoo was founded in the mid 1990s, there wasn't a lot of content on the internet. And so they could employ a team of um, human beings to uh, surf the internet and hand curate the most interesting websites and put them in a web directory. And that was really the birth story of Yahoo. Uh, so Yahoo always saw itself as a media company. They um, built the company off of the people that were in it um, and their judgment. So there was a heavy focus on curation and editorial. Um, and, uh, you know, in contrast, Google was born during a time where there was a lot more content on the internet and it was just too much for humans to sift through. And Larry and Sergey were really interested in creating algorithms that could solve this problem for people. So Google, in contrast, saw itself first and foremost as a technology company, and um, we're very focused on the algorithm. Now, from a design standpoint, both saw the importance of having a performant website. So both focused very heavily on reducing latency um, in the experience. So that played out in the user interface for both companies. That explains why there were very few images and graphics on both sites very early on, because um, there was recognition that any kind of superfluous um, uh, uh, graphics or images would slow down the experience and make it um, uh, and not as positive an experience for people. Because we knew that just an even a 0.04 millisecond delay in serving up web search results or any kind of uh, uh, result would result in um, significant uh, um, negative effects on users. Um, the difference though, is that um, because Yahoo saw itself as a media company, they ended up hiring uh, executives from like Hollywood to run the company. Um, and they um, kind of saw their, themselves as playing against vertical players. So for example, they saw Yahoo Sports as competing against ESPN, Yahoo Personals competed against Match.com. Um, and, um, and, and because of the way the company was organized after the dot-com crash, they placed people who had um, backgrounds in sales and business development in charge as general managers in charge of these different product verticals. And so, and they had their own PL statements. They had their own profit and loss sheets. And so, in effect, the way Yahoo was organized, it was really operating as a federation of a lot of different companies. Um, and there was no singular vision for what Yahoo was, uh, what Yahoo was as a brand. It was really more of a house of brands rather than a branded house. Um, there was no unification. And um, as much as the design team tried to hold it together, um, the practical reality was that um, you know, there was no executive support for having a single look and feel. The Yahoo Personals team wanted a more feminine look because they needed more women uh, on a personal site in order to attract the men. The Yahoo Sports team <laughs> wanted a more masculine look and feel. The Yahoo Movies team wanted a black background <laughs> instead of a white background. Um, and you know, in contrast, Google placed a lot of emphasis on having common infrastructure. Uh, so for example, any company that was acquired by Google, and I think it's even true to this date, they have to spend the first several months moving onto the Google platform, onto Google infrastructure. Um, in contrast, so Yahoo, that was not the case. And so we had multiple listings platforms. We had Yahoo Classifieds, Yahoo Autos, um, Hot Jobs, Yahoo Personals, and they were all the same technology, but they were all separate platforms. And so we were repeating efforts over and over again. So we could not, in effect, reuse design patterns or reuse technology. And so Yahoo became incredibly inefficient in the way that it operated. Google, in contrast, could reuse code. There's common infrastructure. So it allowed Google to scale very efficiently and effectively. Um, and um, it was also, it enabled us to have a common look and feel. Um, so from a design standpoint, greater consistency. 
And the mindset of the founders, they used to have this mantra called one Google. This was back in the mid 2000s. Uh, the idea being that uh, Google was one brand and that every product and service that Google made was ultimately Google um, and not its own thing. Uh, now YouTube and Android are exceptions for, for different reasons. Um, but I do think that you know, the way these two companies played out was a direct outcome of the mindsets of the founders and their personalities. And that plays out in the interface. And this is why I say um, <laughs> that the design that we end up with really is a manifestation of everything that goes into that. It's not just the designers that are creating the design. It's everybody in the whole company that is responsible for creating that experience because every little decision has some consequence that has a ripple effect in the user experience. Wow. Yeah, that's a really good way to, to, to sum up and actually to end. I guess that design is an expression of the culture of the organization at the end of the day. Fantastic. OK, well, we're, we're out of time. Uh, thank you ever so much for, for joining us so early in your day. Uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, Thank you to, to the audience as well for joining us tonight. Uh, and all I can say is please watch out for the next Printify Tech Talk coming soon. All the best. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.